back to another episode of the J Area Podcast. My name is Jose Ramos Jr. And this is a podcast where I share some of my favorite films with you guys and share how each movie was developed as well as analyze them for their significance. Last week we covered Friday the 13th as a way to kind of celebrate Friday the 13th this month. But being that Jason Voorhees originally had started out as a small scale film on the campgrounds of Camp Crystal Lake, eventually it would develop and evolve into something more supernatural. You would see like a zombified Jason start appearing after uh, Jason 5 the beginning. But being that we're going to stay on topic with the whole supernatural effect, I thought what better way to celebrate the newest season of USA Network's series Chucky with the original Child's Play film. It was released November 9th, 1988, which would make it the 35th anniversary this upcoming month. Directed by Tom Holland. No, not the Tom Holland that we all know and love playing Spider-Man, but Tom Holland, the director. A short synopsis for the film is a struggling single mother unknowingly gifts her son a doll imbued with a serial killer's consciousness. Before there was ever Annabelle, the film that is, there was Child's Play, starring Charles Lee Ray, Chucky, the main antagonist of the franchise. And for me, there's a special spot in my heart with this film because I didn't really watch it until I was, you know, well into my teen years. You know, growing up, I knew of Chucky. I knew that there was some kind of killer doll on the loose. I never knew you know, the origins of it or what the films really pertained, but I just knew it was out there. And upon watching it, it's unlike any other slasher film there is. You know, one, the main protagonist of the franchise is is a child. Now, eventually we do see him grow up into being a a full adult, but Andy Barkley in this first film is, is something different. We're not used to seeing children being that of the main protagonist. The film itself, Child's Play, it involves voodoo, and possession and unlike the exorcist where that also deals with possession it's that of a a a serial killer and charles lee ray who we'll get to later on uh, possessing that of a good guy doll and and just there's so many different intricate details that fall into this film as to why it makes it so interesting but don mancini the create the creator and the screenwriter for this film include a lot of his own personal experiences within this franchise Screenwriter Don Mancini had developed the concept while studying as a film major at UCLA, and he was inspired by the consumerism of the 1980s and the effect that marketing would have on children. It was also partly based on his experiences as a child with an advertising executive as a father, so he was already you know, well exposed to the business side of toys and understood the importance of marketing, the demographic, and, and the numbers, and, and just the overall sales of selling toys. But that wouldn't be the last of his father's influence that he would have on this film. In fact, Mancini had a complicated relationship with his father as he felt alienated from his father for being gay. This would prompt Mancini to center the script around a young child with a single mother and no father figure at all. Other influences included the Cabbage Patch Dolls, the film Poltergeist, the character Freddy Krueger, and an episode called The Living Doll from the Twilight Zone series. All of these had some influence on the development of Child's Play. One interesting note is that the original title for the film, rather than Child's Play, would have been Batteries Not Included, which is a reference to one of the more iconic scenes in the film itself. But because that title was already in use, they settled on Blood Buddy. Of course, Blood Buddy wouldn't have been for long as they eventually chose the name Child's Play. As for original test screenings, originally it received negative feedback and they would cut 25 minutes of the film in order to reduce Chucky's screen time. They wanted to reduce his screen time as a way to kind of complement the film itself and build up suspense and tension. One of the biggest examples of that would be like Jaws or the film Alien, where you don't really show the protagonist too much or you know reveal too much of the character as it kind of takes away from the suspense. And although we do see a lot of the good guy doll, we don't see the personality of Chucky in the doll until well into the film. And I think that's a really important aspect of the movie is you don't want to give the audience too much too early because if you give them too much too early, what are they going to stay for later in the film? So I think they, they waited the right amount of time and built up enough tension to um, to reveal Chucky himself. But before we see Chucky in doll form, I think it's always interesting to revisit the the opening chase scene because it's one of the few scenes that we get to see Charles Lee Ray as a human being. I've always enjoyed being dropped into a, you know, a world and having to play catch up in a film, just like in real life, we don't know what other people are going through in their life, and it's almost as if we're being dropped in a moment of their time. So to open the film up with the chasing between Detective Norris and Charles Lee Ray, I, I always find that interesting because we don't know the circumstances, we don't know what's going on, we just know the fact that there's a detective chasing after an individual. Um, he chases him to a toy store, 
where Charles Lee Ray is eventually shot and he realizes that he's dying. So he has to do a last minute, you know, resort and kind of transfer his soul and possess a good guy doll. And this is a scene that would be revisited in other installments of the franchise, but I think it's it's always great just to revisit the the start, you know, the beginning where it all started. And from here on out, we are introduced to Alex Vincent playing Andy Barkley, the main protagonist in this movie, who I think, you know, the more I watch this movie and the older I get, I just find his portrayal of Andy to be like one of the most adorable kids. He's very sweet. He's very smart and resourceful just for his age at six years of old. You can tell that um, that Andy Barkley, very poised and innocent, but his ability to act with the doll is just tremendous. There are, there are some scenes where um, we don't hear Chuck D's voice. It's where Alex Vincent has the doll, pulls him into his ear, and kind of pretends like he's saying something. And just his facial expressions and his body language, are, it's done really well. Whoever had coached the kid in terms of acting on this film did a wonderful job because you can genuinely believe that this doll is speaking to um, to Alex Vincent playing Andy Barkley. Um, yeah, no, I just think it's one of the best ones. And, to, and then to see him evolve into a grown adult, you know, he's in the second film. He would later show up in Colt and Curse of Chucky and, and then the, the Chucky series itself. But to see how he evolved and grew up from this experience is always just interesting. There's a lot of instances where you feel bad for Andy. You know, he gets emotional. He, he, he breaks down sometimes and cries because he realizes that no one believes him. And, and you can see the frustration that he feels um, towards Chucky when he realizes that, like, you're lying to me, you're manipulating me. I mean, he's obviously not using these words, but to have that presence of mind to know that Chucky isn't a good guy because of all the things that he's making him do or making him hide from the adults in his life. Um, it's just so complex to see an actor of that age, six years old, to demonstrate and display so much emotion. And I think that's why a lot of people resonated with Andy's character and and why these films have done so well, you know, aside from the whole Chucky aspect. But I just find that to be interesting. And of course, diving back into like the future trauma, you have to recognize that he's at a young age, six years old, still developing his mind, still developing his emotions. And having these type of experiences, where does it take him from there? How does one come back from a killer-possessed doll, you know, not only killing your mom's friend, but other people around you? And knowing that you, you, have, you can't do anything because people won't believe you and they'll take you away and, and put you away like in an insane asylum. And this film does a really good job at that because in other films, like I'll use like the second film for an example. In Child's Play 2, there's a, a character who is a teacher and is just unreasonably, unreasonably mean and nasty and you just don't care for them. In this film, in the original Child's Play, the adults, they do a good job at showing the adults at, as being real people. You know, they're not, they, when, they, when they don't believe Karen about the doll, Detective Norris doesn't really come off as a jerk. It's just that like he doesn't want anything to do with it. He realizes how, how crazy it sounds, which I can find as to be like a real reaction. They don't play it up. They don't make it any more sinister than it has to be or nasty, that is, in terms of their, their personalities. They, they recognize how crazy it sounds and they just leave it, which I find to be, you know, realistic. And then there's Catherine Hicks, who I think does a great job as Karen Barkley. She portrays the loving mother who just wants to give her son everything, including a good guy doll for his birthday. And I feel like a lot of people can resonate with that, especially that of parents. You know, you want to be able to give your kid everything that they ever wanted in life and, and provide them the things that you didn't have growing up. So to see her performance as that mother, as that mother figure, um, she does a wonderful job. I think everyone plays their role well, and I think they hit their, their strides in midway through this movie. I thought interesting enough, too, there was a photo in Andy's room of what, what you know one could surmise to be his father, and that picture is actually the director, Tom Holland. But aside from the Barclays, who play an intricate role in the whole franchise of the child's play, obviously the main character of it all is Charles Lee Ray. Brad Dourif's voice acting is iconic. He really lends himself to the role. And the array of emotions that he, that he puts on display are just tremendous, whether it's anger, frustration, um, jovial nonsense. He jokes around every now and then. You don't see a lot of the jokes until the second film. But Brad Dourif and his performance is just mesmerizing. You know, every every word that he says, you kind of hang on to it. And I think over the course of these films, the more crazier and funnier that they get, he really finds his stride with the personality of Chucky. Because early on, we don't see much in these early films because they still want to maintain those horror aspects and, and suspense and thriller 
and not show too much of the character. But by the time we get to like Bride of Chucky, that's when his full personality is out and about. He's laughing. He's, he's just a regular guy at this point, just possessing a doll. And also a quick note, Charles Lee Ray is a name derived from like three individuals. Charles being from Charles Manson, Lee being Lee Harvey Oswald, the man that assassinated John F. Kennedy, and Ray being James Earl Ray, who had assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. So I always find it interesting when they have different names, and there's always a reasoning for what what's in a name, right? So to choose the name Charles Lee Ray as a way to mention three of the most infamous figures in American history, again, only leads itself more credence as to why this guy isn't good at all. But what is good is the animatronics and the puppets that are used in this film. Chucky was controlled by a team of nine puppeteers, and in some instances, they included extras that were of small stature or just child actors. The animatronics and the cosmetics were also used for this film, but for a film that was in 1988, the way that they, the way that they presented Chucky, it, you would not have thought it was 1988. You know, there are certain certain scenes where he's running across the hall and it's a quick glimpse, but you know, it, it passes off for what the doll would be, or or the way that the facial expressions move and and the way he speaks and stands and and obviously again we know they're puppets and animatronics, but for the year 1988, which is again 35 years ago. It's done really well, and it only gets better with each film, in my opinion, to the point now where we're at the Chucky television series, and it's like he's a full-blown actor himself. And I just think it's important to, to note that the animatronics and the puppetry are just well done in this film. And you want to talk about well done? I think my favorite scene of the entire film is the big reveal with Karen and Chucky. You know, it's masterfully done. You know, Karen, who has just lost her son to what appears to be like a CPS type of services, she's feeling very down. She's lost everything and has to resort to like the one thing that really seems impossible. She begins to talk to Chucky and asking him to speak to her, you know, to no avail. And then she goes through the box and she finds out that the the batteries fall out of the box. So this whole time, Chucky has been talking to Andy and to everybody else without batteries. So then she pulls up Chucky, turns on the fireplace, and, and is just yelling at Chucky, you know, speak to me or I'm throwing you in the fire. And that's finally when Chucky realizes, okay, like, I got to say something. So Charles Lee Ray reveals himself as the possessed doll and, and takes a bite out of her. But just the buildup is just, it's just fantastic. You, you know, from the beginning, from seeing the batteries to her realizing that, you know, it was never inside him and he's been powered by, by something else, essentially. And then again, this, the full rage that Chucky displays, realizing that, okay, I'm caught. It's one of my favorite scenes, not only in this film, but I just think of this franchise because it really puts a stamp on what this franchise was built upon. And that was just the, the unbridled rage of Chucky. Another iconic scene, of course, would be in, involving the ending. Chucky is hacking through the bedroom door, which is a clear reference to The Shining. And interesting enough, Brad Dourif also appeared in the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which starred Jack Nicholson, who was also in The Shining. And it's, it's something subtle, but for those who watch a lot of movies, they can easily recognize this ending. And certainly Chucky doesn't go down without a fight before being burned alive, which is again a callback to that scene where he's revealed to be alive because Karen is threatening to throw him in the fire. Um, he's blown into bits by a gunshot, he's even decapitated, and then ultimately shot in the heart, which defeats him in this film. But going back with the Shining reference, that film is only eight years removed um, from this one. But again, you can sense a lot of the stylistic and thematic references to that of The Shining. It's, it's They wanted to go with, with something more dramatic, something with a little bit more meat to it, rather than a Friday the 13th film or a Nightmare film. You can sense that this movie wasn't intended to be like this all-time big franchise of serial killers. It was, it was one film that was a possessed doll from a serial killer and targeted an innocent family a random family at that and in, in comparison to other slashers it's not centered around teens and adolescents who are craving drugs and sex and, and there's an added level of suspense in the first half as we do not see chucky rather we're seeing a lot of point of view of a character running which in, a, in itself is a callback to friday the 13th and halloween as i mentioned with those point of view shots as placing us in the position of the killer and an interesting dynamic of it is that a lot of this early scenes in the movie, they're placing blame on Andy. And the dynamic of paranoia and not believing the Barkley family is, is, is something different than what we've seen in, in previous slasher films. 
And then, of course, you know, this is a year after Dream Warriors and Nightmare on Elm Street. And they now had three films of a serial killer who was vocal and somewhat had a sarcastic personality, you know, to him. So it became a welcoming sight for a character to be more vocal, to certainly be more that of a taunting figure than a silent killer like uh, Halloween's Michael Myers or Friday the 13th's Jason. So you can see how the influence of those films in the late 70s and early 80s definitely influenced that of Child's Play. But I do think that a big part of this movie is centered around the idea of consumerism and materialism because there is that sense of an increased level of importance on items or materials. At this point in the film, you know, everyone's buying the good guy dolls. They're the newest crazed, again, a reference to the Cabbage Patch dolls who again, had another craze in the 80s where everyone wanted to buy them. They had to get them for their kids. Everyone had to have one because of that fear of missing out. Everyone wanted to be a part of this new wave of celebrity, this new wave of materialism. And it's something that everyone could relate to. As I mentioned, parents want to be able to give their kids everything. And kids, they want to have the newest toys. They want to have it for for various reasons, whether it's for popularity or, again, just fear for missing out. And it's, it's not like a sense of karma, but it only goes to show you that materialism is in everything. You don't need to have the, the greatest of toys to truly enjoy your childhood. And that's something that Andy Barkley had to find out when he got, you know, a good guy doll that wasn't necessarily a good guy. I would definitely have to say that Child's Play is definitely one of those films that you would have to go out and watch. And you'll see me say that a bunch of times with these movies that I cover just because I feel like there are a lot of movies that individuals should watch at least once just to say that they've seen it. But if you enjoy horror movies, if you enjoy slasher films and the Halloween season, which we are still well into, uh, this is definitely one that I would add to the list. If you haven't seen these movies, give the, if you're going to watch at least one, it's this one. You know, sometimes the newer ones like Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky, they're not for everybody. But that original trilogy of films is definitely a must watch for horror fans. Um, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds the film itself. There were protesters who formed at the main entrance of the um, MGM calling for the film to be banned. And these films have been accused of inspiring violence in children. The director, Tom Holland, he defended the first film stating that the viewers of horror movies could only be influenced by the content if they were unbalanced to begin with. So he, he accepted no blame for it. And I, I think it goes back to what Wes Craven and Scream were saying back in 96, which, I mean, obviously was later in this in this timeline, but it's something we covered in uh, previous weeks in the podcast, where movies don't create killers, they make killers more creative. And it's a narrative that has been going on for as long as movies have been going on, and that's how can they influence individuals. But I think it's important to recognize that at the end of the day, these are, these are movies, they're a form of entertainment, and they're not to be taken seriously or as a playbook for anybody. And there are individuals who need that kind of assistance, they need that kind of help to recognize what's different from reality and what's different from fantasy. Ultimately, in, in terms of a film, which we'll keep it to that, I think Child's Play, the original film, it demonstrates that of the ultimate killer doll. It would cement Chucky as a horror icon and place him up there with the likes of Freddy, Jason, Michael, Ghostface, etc. Um, the film itself would also demonstrate a consistent franchise that basically knows what it is. It's self-aware, it's reinventive, it's found different ways to stay topical and relevant to society as it would spawn six sequels a 2019 reboot, and of course the ongoing television series, as I mentioned, being shown on USA Network. And with that being said, of course, I want to thank you guys again for joining me this week for another episode of the J Area Podcast. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and TikTok at JustJose underscore three. Continue to subscribe and follow the podcast on YouTube. We're doing good numbers on YouTube shorts, and, and the videos themselves are growing slowly but surely, and I much appreciate the support that I've been getting these last few months. Uh, this upcoming week, again, to fall in line with the Halloween season. We only have two weeks left in the Halloween season. And I'll just go ahead and announce it next week's episode, because we mentioned it a couple times during this episode. I'm going to be covering one of the greatest horror films of all time, The Shining, starring Jack Nicholson. I'm very much looking forward to that film, because there's a lot of different layers and themes in terms of tackling you know, talking points about the movie itself. So I'm looking forward to that new episode. Again, if you haven't already, please make sure to follow, subscribe, 
Share with your friends as we keep growing the podcast slowly but surely. Thank you guys again. We will see you next week with the Shining episode.